Good morning and welcome again to St. Peter's, the Apostle Anglican Church in Kingsport. Uh, today we're going to be completing chapter 9. La last week we discussed the uh, linguistic uh, differences between the word for presbyter and elder. And today what we're going to do is we're going to cover the historical observations as to how these words are employed. Now, I got a lot of material. I probably, as Roz has pointed out, that's redundant uh, for me. But I got a lot of material. So what I want to ask you to do is hold your questions until after. If you have a question, try and jot it down. I'll, I'll get to your questions. But I, I just want to get through as much of this as possible. I have 20 pages of notes. Now, I know I'm not going to get through all of it. So I'm just giving you a heads up. Before we begin, I want you to turn your Bibles Turn to Titus in your Bibles. Titus chapter 1. We're going to finish up something that transitions us into this morning's material. I'm going to present to you an analysis of Titus chapter 1 that was provided by the uh, REC presiding bishop Ray Sutton, who was a former Presbyterian. So he he was an advocate at one point of what is now the uh, essentially majority rule within evangelicalism and, and uh, all the denominations that would consider themselves to be evangelicals, uh, elder rule. Okay, And he presents, in my opinion, the best argument from a biblical text against that understanding. And we'll look at this, I'm going to go through it quickly, but you'll see why I wanted to expose you to this argument. So if you're looking at Titus chapter 1, beginning with verse 5, we'll go through verses 5 through 9. For this reason I left you in Crete, so he's telling Titus, this is why I left you there that you should set in order the things that are lacking and appoint elders, quote unquote, in every city as I commanded you. Now, if a man is blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of dissipation or insubordination. So that's the first bracket. Elders are supposed to be this. For a bishop must be blameless as a steward of God, not self-willed, not quick-tempered, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money, hospitable, a lover of what is good, sober-minded, just, holy, self-controlled, holding fast the faithful word as he has been taught that he may abide by sound doctrine, both to exhort and convict those who contradict. Now, think of those two sections, 5 and 6 and 7 through 9, right? In the first section, Paul gives his explanation. Well, why, why I'm leaving you here? And he says that he should set things in order that are lacking. So something was missing, right? So he's now telling Titus, fix it. And that Titus, not as an apostle, but he has an apostolic authority as a bishop, he should appoint elders Notice, in every city. And that he should determine who are qualified to be in ministry and what their ministry should be. Right? Okay? So, you, 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 and you, you guys qualify. And we're going to send you out to various cities. And it's important that you realize when we talk about this type of setup, authorities being placed in positions, it isn't in one church. We get this impression that when the word elders, especially in Acts, when, and hopefully I'll be able to get that today, but when you get to Acts 20, it says Paul gathered all of the elders. The way people talk today, it's as if that term elders is implying that Paul is talking to the elders of a church. That's the implication that people are making. The problem is, he's talking to the elders at Ephesus, and we know 
that Ephesus didn't have one church. Ephesus had a lot of churches. So when he talks to the elders, he's not talking to just one group of people in one church. He's talking to people that are going to be the authority over many church. And that bears on the relationship between these two terms. So what are the qualifications? So he turns around and he tells Titus that a presbyter, a priest, or an elder should have these qualities. Three. A husband of one wife, faithful children, and not be unruly or accused of riot. Okay? Now, let's look at 7 through 9. He speaks then of the transition to bishop. And in this case, he identifies 13 different qualities. Now, just on that analysis alone, there's something different about the two positions. Just on that alone. So they can't be synonymous. Now, they can be related, but they're not synonymous. They're not interchangeable. So a bishop must be blameless, not self-willed, not soon angry, not given to wine, not violent, not a striker, not given to filthy lucre, not concerned with money. Haha, <laughs> that quote disqualifies most of them. A lover of hospitality, a love today, a lover of hospitality, a lover of good men, sober, just, holy, temperate, holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. This is the sum and substance of this argument. Now, if the terms are interchangeable, if elder and bishop are interchangeable, if presbyteros and episcopos are interchangeable, why the repetition of so few of the characteristics? Why are there only three for an elder and 13 for a bishop? Okay? Why the subtle difference? Why the more extensive list for an episcopos or a bishop? If the terms presbyteros and episcopos, elder and bishop, are essentially the same, all Paul is saying by the repetition of the term blameless is appoint elders who are blameless because an elder must be blameless. Okay. We call that a tautology. Something that is true by definition and it's merely repeated. For instance, a round baseball is a baseball that is round. Okay. That's a tautology. So, all that would be happening if we're dealing with an interchangeable set of terms is a repetition, slightly rearranging the word. And that's not what's taking place here. However, if Paul is instructing Titus as a bishop, different than an elder, he's advising Titus to appoint elders. In other words, ordain people. And, ab and appoint them who are pure. Why? Because that's the foundational characteristic of a bishop. Or in other words, Paul is building on the previous office. An elder has to be this, but a bishop has to be that, and then some. Alright? Um, now the standard, of course, is the Lord Jesus and he exemplified in the ecclesiastical standard the bishop who is supposed to emulate our Lord, who then is to appoint leaders. He is to appoint out of the group of elders, priests, who are to be both he and the Lord Jesus blameless. Not sinless. Only the Lord can make that claim. But to put it another way, what Paul is telling Titus is ordain these people who meet the necessary qualifications to the priesthood. So we saw last week what presbyteros, or what an elder was. It's a category of description. We see that reinforced here. It's a class of individuals. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, we have nine women here. Okay, so we have 
the class of women, but not every woman, is a senior or junior warden. See the difference? Women, but specific offices. Elder, but pulled from the elder priest. That's what we're talking about when we talk about the distinction between the two. And we went into that last week. Now, now we get into the historical material. Okay? And it is important for us to keep in mind that the historical material becomes, if not more important, cer certainly equally as important as the linguistic material for this reason. When we talk to people, at least those that are generally more knowledgeable about this elder bishop thing, what they will do is they will cite the early church. So they, they cite historical observations, and they will then cite the synagogue. And Roz and I were briefly chatting about this earlier. And you'll notice that whenever they cite the synagogue, they always say, well, in the synagogue, da 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 and then they never describe what was taking place in the synagogue. They never describe who was leading the synagogue. And this is what we're going to talk about today. And I'm going to point out three terms that, and if you'll notice, three terms that bear on the discussion of what's taking place within the synagogue. And I'll get to the actual definition, uh, ex explanations in just a second, but this is Gerousia. And what Gerousia means is a council of elders. All right? Then there's the Archon. Think of Arch. Archbishop. Archdeacon. And the Archon is a ruler. And then there's the, hold on to your hats, the Archisynagogues. So if this is the archon and the ruler, what would the arch of synagogues be? Ruler of the synagogue, right? This, this term is usually identified as the president of the synagogue, which is where many of the Anglican communions today get the, de the uh, designation as a presiding bishop. He's the president of the House of Bishops, okay? So, if we can sit and look at the historical material that they cite and demonstrate that elder and bishop are different terms, their argument collapses. They can no longer, right? They can't go back and say, well, the synagogue says this. Well, yeah, it does, but it doesn't mean what you say it means. Because we have these three terms with which we must deal. And I can do it right now if I don't get through all of it. I'm going to get to the last paragraph I wrote because it is critical to understand why this becomes so important in our discussion. Anyway, okay, so we have already talked about very briefly that in the Old Testament, that apart from the question of age, an elder had a number of governmental or administrative functions. Now I'm going to tell you right now, if you don't get any of this as you're taking notes, I'm taking this directly from the book so you're not going to lose out on anything if you can't get the notes down. It comes straight out of chapter 9 under the heading historical observations. So it's all there for you. You're not going to miss anything. So if you want, you can just sit back and listen to me lecture and then you can go to the book later on. You can jot down page numbers or whatever. Alright, so in the Old Testament we see that an elder besides being old had a governmental or administrative position. Alright, and we see that in Joshua 24 31, 1 Kings 12, 6. So from the divine revelation that God gave on Sinai, Mount Sinai to Moses, administrators became prominent in the Mosaic economy. They were there in Egypt. They were called national elders. Exodus 3.16, Exodus 
and Joshua 24, 1 and 2. When they arrived in Canaan, they were called elders of Israel or elders of the land, 1 Samuel 4, 3, 1 Kings 20, verse 7. Or elders of the tribes, Deuteronomy 31, 28. Or elders of the city, Deuteronomy 19, 12, and then compare that with Deuteronomy 16, 18. And then there is Ruth 4, 9, and 11. There were elders during the period of the judges, Judges 2, 7, period of the kings, 2 Samuel 17, 4, under Babylonian captivity, Jeremiah 29, 1, and during the post-exilic period, Ezra 5, 5. The force of the historical observation is clear. Grown, mature, wise old men were considered elders and they held various governmental administrative positions. They were not ordained as priests. Old Testament elders, the category, were not a part of the Levitical priesthood. And it can't be emphasized and stressed enough. As we have talked about from day one, the New Testament's dependence upon the Old Testament. And the meaning of certain concepts carry over which provides the etymological heredity for the New Testament meaning of words and terms. The constant reference to New Testament elders as in some sense ministers or of an ordained clergy is pure fiction in the point in this point in, his, in history. It just isn't true. Now there are three main references I use in the book. I'm only going to cite one, but the three references are mentioned in the book. Two are, well actually, yeah, two are German, one's a Scotsman. Emil Schur, Heinrich Gratz, I'll spell it if you want me to, and then of course everyone knows Alfred Edersheim. These are the <laughs> okay. Some people know Alfred Edersheim. Anyway, Alfred Edersheim was a Scotsman who was a Presbyterian that became an Anglican later in life. As all smart people do. Um, anyway, um, Schur's name is spelled E M I L S C H Umlat U R E R. You know what Umlat the two dots above the U? Okay, just checking. I don't know what I'm going to get away with here. Um, Heinrich Graz, H-E-I-N-R-I-C-H, last name G-R-A-E-T-Z, and then of course Alfred, and then Edersheim, E-D-E-R-S-H-E-I-M. Now, I'm going to cite Schur simply for brevity, and we're not going to be that brief anyway. Uh, so, Schur wrote a book uh, in the 1800s the history or a history of the Jewish people in the time of Jesus Christ. Ju sure, it was a German Protestant. Now, I want you to keep that in mind. A German Protestant. So he is not writing from an Anglican position. Same with Heinrich Graz. They were not writing from an Anglican position and yet they come to the same conclusion. This book has been updated by Giza Vermes, G-E-Z-A-V-E-R-M-E-S, if you're interested. And Schur makes this statement, listen very carefully. In view of this fact, it is highly instructed to find that upon the Roman inscriptions, we nowhere meet with the title Presbyteros, or any other like it by which to denote the member of the Gerousia, the Council of Elders, as such. For the Archon 
were certainly not ordinary members, but the committee of the Garcia. All right, so we're talking about committees and individuals in committees. This fact can only be accounted for from the circumstance that it is, pay attention, only the offices properly so called that are mentioned by name upon these epitaphs of Rome, whereas the elders were not looked upon as officials in the technical sense of the word. The elders were not looked upon as technical officials or officials in the technical sense of the word. They were the representatives and advisors of the community, but not officials, get this, with specific functions entrusted to them. So when the Romans threw these titles up, they were simply describing guys running around the synagogue with no official technical function. They just had certain titles applied to them, or designations would actually be a more accurate description. So initially we must notice that Schur introduces two terms, Gerusia and Archon, or the plural Archontes, all right, just a lot of Archons. So Schur is, inf Schur is informing us that in archaeological discoveries, the inscriptions found on Roman buildings indicate elders are not officials in the technical sense but merely community representatives and advisors with no specific function. Now this certainly would make it difficult for those who identify the term elder with any sense in which elder is used contemporaneously in Christianity because they use elder contemporaneously as an ordained position. And the Romans said, no, you, these guys are just, okay, they, they, they're just mouthpieces. That's all they are. So he continues, beside the elders who had the general direction of the affairs of the congregation, special officers were appointed for special purposes. Special officers were appointed for special purposes. Elders, according to Schur, during this time of our Lord Jesus, had no special function. Theirs was a general administrative duty. And I'm going to be hammering this, so please bear with me, because if you get this, you'll be able to handle anything that your Baptist, Evangelical, Presbyterian friends tell you. Because Schur's material is devastating. It just is. And, I'm, and there's like a thousand other books I could have referred to. But his, his is really, really problematic for our people today. So there's as a general, uh, excuse me, as general administrative duty, this is an, this is obviously a carryover from the Old Testament understanding of the purpose of an elder, in distinction from an ordained position, such as a priest. Okay, so we see the carryover right away. Now he makes uh, a statement, and listen carefully. In the generic ministry of a synagogue. There are no specific duties of any kind assigned. Now this does change, but there are no specific duties of any kind assigned. Now why does that matter? So the reading of scripture, public prayer, preaching were open to anyone. This explains why Jesus could walk into the synagogue, pick up the scroll of Isaiah and read it, and then sit down and preach. Now, listen. Sure states, but though no official readers, preachers, and liturgists were appointed, it was above all necessary that an official should be nominated who should have the care of the external order of public worship, 
and the supervision of the concerns of the entire synagogue in general. And he would be this. He would be the Ark Synagogue. This was the ruler of the synagogue. And these rulers are met with in the entire sphere of Judaism and not only in Palestine at the time of Jesus. Egypt, Asia Minor, Greece, Italy, and the Roman Empire in general saw this format. Now, with this type of loose structure or modifications, there would naturally uh, occur, eventually, an elder to be elected to be the ruler of the synagogue. Remember, we're drawing from categories to fill functions. So historically, this ruler of the synagogue or president of the synagogue has been seen as the highest of the three synagogue orders. And what do you think develops out of this? Bishops. And they would assume at that time the same function in the church as the president had in the synagogue. And they would become intertwined, right? Because of the relationship between Judaism as it preached the word bringing in Gentiles. And sure notes that he points out that this office and title were transferred from the Jews to Jewish Christian churches. Quite a natural move when you think about it. Now sure goes straight to the heart of the matter. In comparing elder Presbyteros with what would become bishop, the Arca Synagogue. He says this that this office differed from that of an elder of the congregation is proved by the joint occurrence of the titles Presbyteroi and Arca Synagogues. Do you get that? The titles were used as one. Now that's important to realize. Because the first thing people are going to say is, well that just pro proves the point of synonymy. Not quite. So, the Presbyteroi and Arctic Arca Synagogue differed because both titles were used concurrently. Or in other words, not actually, which we might think, not actually were unified, they were used separately to describe two different things. They were used concurrently. It's most instructive that according to the evidence of the inscription, one and the same person could fill both the offices of Archon, a ruler, not, not an elder, a ruler. So he already has a high level position and he could be the president of the synagogue, which makes sense because that's what bishops would have done, right? They would have been the chief honcho, the number one dude, the big kahuna in a synagogue. However, a ruler or the archon could fill both offices of ruler, I just said this, ruler and ruler of the synagogue. In other words, a ruler could be a bishop. Yet even these two officers had a, offices had a distinction. The archon or the archontes, the plural version, were in the dispersion the chiefs of the congregation in whose hands lay direction in general or have similar functions to a senior warden in that sense. They, they deal with, it's actually more of a combined senior-junior warden because they would have 
all sorts of responsibility. They would set up how the service would be conducted, where all of the items would go, who's going to, you know, if somebody came in, if they were expecting somebody, they could have something scheduled for a guest speaker, something along those lines. The office, therefore, of Arca Synagogues was at all events distinct from theirs. Okay, so they do a lot. These guys sit above and supervise. Okay. Nor can he have been the chief. He couldn't have been that. The chief of the Archontes, who was called, there's a lot of conflation of terms, the Gerosia Archontes, so the highest of the elders of the Council of Elders. Okay? He had therefore, he had therefore nothing to do with the direction of the community in general. That was his responsibility, the Archon. His office, on the contrary, was that specifically of public worship. Once the individual became a chief ruler or ruler of the synagogue or president of the synagogue or Arca Synagogues, his, that was his primary duty, public worship. He could not become ruler of the council. His specific responsibility was pastoral care, which is what every bishop's responsibility was to be. He was called Arca Synagogues, not as the head of the community, but as the conductor of their assembly for public worship. As a rule, he was indeed taken out of, out of members of the elders of the congregation And among his functions is specially or specifically mentioned that of appointing who should read scripture, prayer, and summoning fit persons to preach and appointing those who would give a benediction. At the end, he was functioning as a bishop. The primary role of the president of the synagogue, the Arca Synagogues, was being the leader of a church's public worship leader of the church's public worship. He might be taken from the elders of the congregation, meaning his duties were distinct from their duties, and they were not interchangeable. He had the duty that every bishop had and has today, being a leader, appointing readers, those to pray, and preachers. Jewish elders were not responsible for worship in the synagogue or the temple, they, though they enjoyed seats of honor at the synagogue assemblies. Doubtless the synagogue rulers were frequently elected from among their number. Okay? Now, I think that pretty much does a, a fair job of establishing the distinction that exists amongst these three positions, with these three terms, which then would bear on our relationship between elders and bishops. They're not the same. There's no historical evidence that they are the same. The synagogues specifically say they're not the same. Now, let's see. Uh, they have already covered that. It would make sense then that the president of the synagogue would then morph into being a bishop since his primary, primary role is pastoral care and appointing oversight and leaders. So, the fact that the synagogue had numerous individuals with varying duties does not mitigate or alter or change the argument against the position of the ruler of the synagogue being a bishop because, as stated earlier, there would have to have been a transition period from the Mosaic theological understanding, the Mosaic theological content, to the Christological theological content. So 
this having the parallel functions that we identify now as a bishop would have to go through some historical development to become a bishop. Because here we're still talking about Jewish synagogues. And that's a critical point that I'm going to get to in a minute. On the contrary, the fact that there were numerous ministries in the early church, I don't know if you've ever looked at some of the early offices, but there were up to 12 different ministries in the early church. The early church had three primary. They had bishop, priest, and deacon. But then they had stuff like exorcist, evangelist, etc. They had all sorts of minor offices, which eventually would wind up fading away and become folded into the three main offices. So that only supports the tight connection between the synagogue and the church. Multiple offices, multiple people doing multiple things. So God not only progressively revealed his word to his people, which we know he did, we don't see the crucifixion directly stated in the Old Testament, but we see all sorts of allusions to it, and he progressively reveals that. So he not only progressively revealed his word to his people, he progressively revealed how to understand it. We have the ministry of the Holy Spirit to his church. Now I want to point out, turn to pages 204 and 205 in the book. Okay, I'm going to cite just a couple. Now this comes from Bishop Thomas Schenck. And he wrote a book called The Continuing Ministry of Christ Among Us. It's a very short little pamphlet. Excuse me, triple the book. But he cites all sorts of fathers in reference to this discussion. And the one that I and the two that I quote here are from Ignatius and Hippolytus or Hippolytus. So on page 204, St. Ignatius of Antioch, where the bishop appears, there let the people be, as where Christ Jesus is. There is the church Catholic. He who is within the sanctuary is pure, he who is outside is impure. That's to say, he who does, does anything apart from bishop, presbytery and deacon. Now that would make sense understanding that certain individuals were taken out of the presbytery to become priests. It's also interesting to note that there is no equivalent in Latin to the Greek presbyteros. There are parallels, but they're not really solid parallels. The Latin equivalent is senior. Senior, older. But that doesn't carry the same concept as a class that is more thoroughly defined by the Hebrew Zarkane, which from which we get Presbyterian. So da, 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 it's not pure in his conscience. If one follow if one follow a separatist, he does not inherit the kingdom of God. For everyone whom the master of his household sendeth to be his steward over his house, we ought to receive as him that sent him. Plainly, then, we ought to regard the bishop as the Lord himself. For even Jesus Christ, and I can hear the snickers in the background already. For even Jesus Christ, our inseparable life is the manifest will of the Father. So also bishops settled everywhere to the utmost bounds of the earth, as so by the will of Christ. That is what a bishop is supposed to be. Let all reverence the deacons as the appointment of bishop. Excuse me. I'm still hearing snickers. Let all reverence the deacons as the appointment of Jesus Christ. Bishops as Jesus Christ, who is the Son of the Father. And the presbyters as the Sanhedrin of God, assembly of the apostles. Apart from these, there is no church. That's what bishops, deacons, and priests are supposed to be. 
Yes, I know. With, now Hippolytus, with the agreement of all, let the bishops lay their hands on him and the presbytery stand in silence. Now, I want you to notice something. The presbytery, talking about a class, a group. And we know in the, in scripture that not only did clergy lay hands on those to be ordained, but actually the administrators of the synagogue of the church did as well. We see that in the Old Testament. Laying on of hands was by the community. Not only the priests, not only Moses, not only Aaron, but the community. Why? And we'll get to that in a minute. But it's for confirmation that the whole community confirms that these people now that's changed today, basically because you can't have 150 people up around the altar laying hands on somebody. And now pour forth that power which is from thee, the Father, of the princely spirit which thou didst deliver to thy beloved child, Jesus Christ, which he bestowed on thy holy apostles who established the church. All right? So this is just some of the material from the fathers that points out three offices. The difficulty comes when we see the fathers using the term presbyter or presbytery and we automatically assume that that's the same thing that is meant today. It is not. It just isn't. So you have to take the preponderance of the information and then apply it to how it's used in these specific situations. This becomes critical when we deal with St. Jerome, which we will deal with, uh, not next week, but the next time we meet, second week of July. We will get into why St. Jerome becomes so critical. Okay? So when you look at the term presbytery, it's talking about something like this. Remember, this is what we're essentially copying, right? Bish uh, High priest, priest, deacon, Garcia, Archon, Arch, Synagogues, Bishop, Priest, Deacon. Okay, this is the continuation, this is the movement forward. So when we see the fathers talking about presbytery, not an ordained position, he's talking about the body of individuals from whom ministers are chosen. Right? And even in scripture, elders, we see in Psalms, that elders are supposed to be given respect. That they don't have to have an ordained office to be treated respectfully. Okay, I have a whole bunch of New Testament texts I'm going to skip over because it essentially points out what we are talking about here. I'm just going to cite one, just as an example so that we can get to your questions if you have them. If you look at Acts 4, 5. Acts chapter 4, verse 5. What we see in Acts 4, 5 are archontas, the feminine version of this in the Greek, and presbuteros, so now we see these two used side by side. And we also see teachers mentioned. And then if you go down to verse 23, we have chief priests and elders. So, if as argued, as I have argued, that the Old Testament model is in place, the trifold office upon which the New Testament Trifold office is based, which we see here in the synagogue. We see here plainly two separate offices an office of chief priests and an office of elders, and that is even presupposing that in this context, elder means an ordained position, which it doesn't. So the office of chief, chief priest and that of an elder cannot be the same office, even in the New Testament, because Elder was not an office yet. That happens like hundreds of years later. And that happens simply out of usage. The term was used so frequently 
that the term eventually came to mean what was being drawn from it. So presbyter was used so often to refer to men being ordained to the priesthood that eventually they just conflated the two and it came to mean priest. So that's how that wound up happening. All right. Now I mentioned Acts 20, Paul talking to the elders. But here's the key. The assumption implied is that there's only one church. If he's speaking to one church in Ephesus with all of these elders, we have the equivalent essentially of a modern day megachurch today. But the persecution from either the Jews or the Romans would have made something of this nature a very large church and highly unlikely at this moment. This is not a repetition of Pentecost, which was set in the context of the mandatory Jewish festivals. So there would have been large caravans of people from all over everywhere coming. Now, there are people that will reject that, but that's the sense one gets in these discussions. But we know that the epistle to the Ephesians and the epistle to the Colossians were what we call circular epistles, meaning they were not sent to an individual church, they were sent to the region. They were sent to the entire city of Ephesus, the entire city of Colossae. And some people want to argue that Ephesians and Colossians were essentially the same book that wound up being separated. I don't think so, but that is out there. And we see this in Revelation 1, 4, where the Apostle John is writing to the seven churches in Asia. So right there, we, there's more than one church that's being addressed. However, upon careful reading of what John is talking about, one sees that these are what we call today seas, or, or cathedral churches. So John is talking to seven cathedral churches that then would have dioceses underneath them. You know, they weren't called that then, but that's essentially what they were. They would have had little regions of churches in various places. So this understanding changes, essentially, the dynamic of the argument. With multiple churches, there would have to be multiple bishops and or priests to minister to those congregations. Now this, when considering Acts 20, is not a matter of ordaining men to the office of elder, as if it were an ordained office. We've already seen that that's not what elder means. This is a matter of Paul setting up administrators. He's setting up people to govern the churches ordaining men out of this group the category of mature grown men presbyters out of the group to either the office of bishop which would explain verse 28 of Ephesians 20 I mean Acts 20 or to be ordained to the priesthood and he's leaving these bishops among them with episcopal authority to ordain and exercise church discipline. Now, one last illustration and then I'm going to start summing all of this up. You have been very good and very patient. Cookies for everybody. Here. What happens when we get to Timothy and Titus? This this is this these two these two people and the situation, the circumstances involving their ordination is so misunderstood, it creates much of the problem we have today. Let us for just a second up, um, apply the concept today that is used for ordination. Okay? What winds up happening? Somebody's identified. Somebody expresses a desire to be ordained. They're then brought before whatever. They're brought before their church. They're brought before a standing committee. They're brought before um, a, uh, a clergy council. 
Board of Examining Chapter, all of this stuff, right? But they're brought before a group of people. And these people are examined, right? And then they are ordained or approved. Sound about right, right? Pretty much what you're familiar with. Is that what happened with Titus and Timothy? No. Paul went in, laid hands on Timothy, laid hands on Titus, said, abracadabra, hocus pocus, boom, your vision. Now, obviously, he didn't say that, but he did it himself. Why didn't he have to take him to the Jerusalem Council? Why didn't he have to take it back to Jerusalem? Why didn't he have to take them back to Jerusalem to face the Council of Elders or the Presbytery? Why didn't he have to do that? If this was the proper way to ordain that they had to be examined by all of the big muckety mops, if all the other 11 apostles had to be there to ordain men, why didn't Paul have to do this? Now, we can talk about the practical problem because they were all scattered like the wind. And only James at this point would have been left in Jerusalem as the bishop of Jerusalem. But it's because Paul was a bishop and he had, excuse me, Paul was an apostle and he had the authority to singularly do that. Now, we know, we know that the, the apostolic office is unique and is not repeated. However, the authority of the apostles was repeated. But even with that unique authority, men still were brought before all of the apostles, right? Acts chapter 1. What do we have in Acts chapter 1? We have a specific reference to, number one, a, an Episcopal office. Acts 1.20. The word in Acts 1.20 is, is episcopes. It's identifying the office of a bishop. And who was brought before them to fill the role of Judas? Two guys. And then Matthias was chosen, right? Okay. So we know that on the one hand, the apostle can ordain or consecrate. But on the other hand, we know that there is a procedure that can be followed where they're brought to a specific location. But it isn't mandatory. That's the key. Which it would be in this situation, Paul would have been wrong if today's contemporary understanding of how to ordain was the only proper way to do it. Okay? One last verse and then I'm going to sum all of this up. Look at 1 Timothy 4.14. I'll give you a second to turn there. All of this is predicated upon two points. What we said last week, well actually more than that, but it's predicated upon what we said in reference to the terms themselves and the meaning of their terms and the historical input that we have in reference to how the terms play out in practice. So when you combine... Anyway, I'm getting ahead of myself. I'm going to stop right there. Just keep that in mind. 1 Timothy 4.14 Do not neglect the gift that is in you which was given to you by prophecy with the laying on of hands of the eldership. 
Now, initially, this appears to be the straightforward explanation of ordination of an ordination setting, right? The eldership, whatever that is, get, got together, laid hands on, in the case of Timothy, and ordained him. However, we once again run into the issue of what a term means in the broader context. Much of what has already been written concerning the term elder, or presbyteros, applies here. Therefore, I'm only going to make a couple of, uh, a few observations. All right? Four. Number one. All of what has previously been stated concerning the definition of elder or presbyteros applies to this particular text as well. All right? So when you see amongst the elders, it could be the council of elders, the administrative guys, or included in that group would have been ministers. All right? That's certainly a possibility. Second, it would not be unusual for, I just repeat myself, for a group or body of elders to lay hands on a man at his ordination as a means of recognition, confirmation, and support. This practice is seen in the Old Testament, even though the elders did not ordain anyone. Right? We see it all the time in the Old Testament. But they're not priests that are exclusively doing it. They did, however, lay hands on individuals as a sign of the office about to be assumed and the gift imparted by God, confirmed by the laying on of hands. And in other words, Itzhak Cohen is recognized by the elders of the 12 tribes of Israel, which is an extract, it probably would just be one tribe, but he's recognized by whatever tribe he's from as being somebody with whom the gifts he has have been imparted by God. So what do they do? They go and lay hands on him to confirm that they've recognized that. There may be priests involved. There may not. But there usually would have been at least one important Moses, Aaron, or somebody along those lines would have been a amongst the group of elders doing this. And what do we see? Well, this practice has continued today in Anglican, Roman Catholic, and Greek Orthodox churches, where the bishop ordains the priest and then has fellow clergy come forward and lay hands on the newly ordained priest. You ever been to an Anglican, an Anglican ordination where you see a priest? It's one of the most spectacular sights you'll ever see if, if you've never experienced it. To see that sea of red standing around that priest, laying hands on him, confirming apostolic succession and the transmission of authority to the bishop. It's just, it's phenomenal. Third, if one compares this with 2 Timothy 1.6, it's quite clear in that text, Paul says the gift Timothy received was by the laying on of my hands. It was the apostle who ordained Timothy and laid his hands on Timothy just as bishops do today. The elders or presbyters, whether clergy or no, would have been laying on their hands in much the same way as, as it is done today, acknowledging and endorsing the one who is to be a new clergyman. And finally, in the next chapter, and I've mentioned this, we deal with St. Jerome and the assertions made concerning his views on the subject. This question of who ordains is mentioned in a slightly more detailed manner. And you will find that St. Jerome will be, if, to, to those that are really knowledgeable, St. Jerome will be thrown in your face. Believe me, it's much ado about nothing. And when you read chapter, when we get to that, you'll see why. Okay. So in conclusion, the classic theory of Bishop Lightfoot, and this is Bishop Lightfoot, that the episcopate arose out of the presbyterate by a gradual process where one of the elders of a local church was elevated to the position of a monarchical bishop has won a lot of support amongst Anglicanism. There's also the argument from St. Jerome, which I keep referring to, but we will get to that, around the 5th century that is in concert with Bishop Lighthood, which will be dealt with later. However, 
What's unfortunate is most people merely regurgitate these arguments from 300 years ago, and in some cases earlier. And they regurgitate the arguments from Lightfoot and others. With all due respect to the good bishop, Lightfoot didn't have access to the linguistic booth we have today. And even though St. Jerome is an ancient, ancient source, there are more ancient sources, much closer to the apostles, having been taught by the apostles, Ignatius for one, that I believe offsets St. Jerome's claims, if they are intended to be understood as has been claimed by our opponents. But again, we'll get to that later. So what is often overlooked is the discussion. In this discussion is the organic historical development taking place in the early centuries of the early church. We seem to forget that when we read the New Testament, we are interacting with Orthodox first century Jews that not only worshipped in the temple and prayed in the synagogues, but who believed that they were the true remnant of Israel and therefore were in fact the true Israel. So as here we see the historical development of the early church in three, at least three, could be more different stages. The first, Jewish followers of Christ, Jewish Christians, worshiping in the temple according to the divine pattern as established in the Old Testament that was revealed to Moses and, com and commanded to be followed precisely by God as stated. As these Orthodox Christians shared the gospel, the early church grew, and the second stage would be initiated, and that is the expansion of the Jewish Christian church would result in Gentiles being saved and coming into the covenant community. Right? So far, right? Makes sense? This union would create practical tension between the two groups, wouldn't it? Gentiles and Jews? <coughs> You know, dogs and cats having fun I mean we just don't do that so what is and isn't required of Gentiles then becomes an issue for the Jewish Christian community hence the first council of the church in Jerusalem as recorded in Acts 15 to sort this out. This would then set the pattern of development, alteration, and growth for the early church that would continue for at least the next or first five centuries, the first 400 years. In other words, before I get on to the last one, in other words, there is the implication that once the resurrection occurred, boom, we had the church. And when we talk about the church, that's what it is. And we already know what it is and how it functioned and who is what. No, we don't. And, the, and Acts 15 points that out very clearly. We still were working, trying to figure out what all of this was about. So Jews were the first ones to accept Christ, then they start preaching, and all of a sudden, oh my gosh, Gentiles are coming in. What do we do with this? Now we have the Jerusalem Council, and that leads to the last stage, and after the Jerusalem Council initially addressed the issue of Gentile participation in the church, evangelism would then slowly begin to include Gentiles as, in the, as the word of God was spread. However, since the primary venue for preaching God's word was still Jewish synagogues. This is where the Jews would go. Resistance occurred and ultimately there would be a parting of the two groups creating three subgroups. You would have exclusively Jewish Christian churches, you would have hybrid churches of Jewish and Gentile Christians, and then you would have purely Gentile churches. This is a lot of development to take place. And because of this development, terms, functions, offices would change. So Bishop Lightfoot, on the one hand, was kind of correct. But on the other hand, he didn't have the linguistic tools to make the sharp distinction for 
presbyteros for elder that we have today that clarifies much of the confusion. What we have been seeing is the progressive development of both the linguistic and practical aspects of the church predicated upon a Christological, theological paradigm. Remember, they had to get away from the constraints of thinking under the Mosaic economy to implement the Messiah's economy or paradigm. So there was the movement from Moses to Christ, and that took a bit of time. We see a change of the three clerical orders of high priest, priest, and Levite, to Gerusia, Archon, Archisynagogues, and then bishop, priest, and deacon. But this took a bit of time. But one thing would have been paramount, paramount, in their thinking, and that is no matter how the development, no matter what's going to transpire in the future, it will be three offices. Because they are Orthodox <coughs> Jews, and this is what they would have passed on to Gentiles. We often forget that the church needed to work out many, 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 many issues resulting in numerous church councils, right? Both small and regional ones, as well as the four that we know are the most famous. I bet you wouldn't be aware that there was a council in 212, a council in 267. A I mean, I could just go on. There were small regional councils that took place <coughs> um, throughout the early church. Some of them actually bear on Nicaea. There were three councils that act, 267 and 312, uh, actually one of the bearing on Nicaea. <coughs> and then there was another one thrown in between there and 307. I mean, the councils all over the place. Issues had to be resolved. So, here then we see how not only familiar terms involved would have undergone the necessary theological fine-tuning to meet the current ecclesiastical need, but also the practice, as well as theological clarification. Excuse me. <coughs> Pardon me. All right, I'm going to summarize. You ready? A. The term presbyteros in both Old and New Testament usage simply means bearded, older man with integrity or dignity. B. When examining the term in its biblical, historical, and theological context, there's new linguistic identity, etymologically speaking, between presbyteros, or elder, and episcopos, or bishop. There's a connection, and that connection is determined by context and usage and cannot merely be asserted as a proof of virtual interchangeability. C, in my estimation, I should have included that in the book, Schur has conclusively shown that presbyteros, elder, from the Hebrew zakain, elder, was distinct from and not at all synonymous with archisynagogues or bishop. In other words, while the synagogue utilized the office of archisynagogues, it did not identify that office with a lower or equal office called presbyteros, which didn't even exist. D. Schur has also shown that even given the most favorable development, Presbyteros, or elder, did not evolve into an ordained office until the third century and then only, only in the Jewish synagogue community. E, when one then considers the New Testament usage of Presbyteros, or elder, all the previous elements must be factored into the understanding of the term. I don't know how I can make that clearer to people. You can't divorce the term from all of the linguistic, historical, and theological data that is accompanying its usage. If you do, it becomes a flat term that was defined in the 16th century by the reformers to mean what they wanted it to mean at that time, and that is anachronistic. That's reading back into 
the time period. Therefore, even if, and that is a significant if, Tresbuteros was used in the New Testament in some way to speak of clergy in some manner, it was speaking of them as having the quality of being a presbyteros, an elder, a distinguished bearded old man with integrity. Therefore, there is a presbyteros, an elder, out of which comes an office, say, priest. But no case can be made of the term being used as an office at this time in the church. The only way that happens is when you force your presupposition from the Reformation back into this. And that's what is done. They force it. Instead of allowing all of what we've been talking about for going on seven months now, allowing it to define these terms. F, what has not been extensively discussed is the way in which language practically develops in the context of usage. A more perspicuous manner to identify New Testament clergy would have been to use the phrase, the priest who is presbyter, presbyteros. The priest who has the qualities of an elder or the presbyteros priest. That would have been a clearer way of saying it, but as you can see, that's a bit cumbersome. I mean, that's just, that's a mouthful. It would only be natural then to conflate the two terms for brevity, even though they are not speaking of the same thing. They are not speaking of an ordained office. The writers and their audience would have naturally understood the short, shorthand manner of speaking, which would be lost to us today due to time and linguistic change. For them to say, Brother Saul is a presbyteros in the fourth century, ultimately would have meant that they understood that to mean that Brother Saul was a distinguished bearded old man with dignity who holds an ordained position. Language is a strange thing as it develops sometimes. And we use it today. Think about the word. How, how many have a King James Bible? Go ahead and read the King James Bible. Yeah. Come across the word conversation, right? You know what conversation? What does conversation mean today? Right. Speaking, right? Con, with, verso, voice, language, speech. You know what it meant then? How to walk a, in a way of life. That's what it meant. That's what conversation meant in the King James. But how do we determine what someone's way of life is today? By what they say. So you see the transition, the language, the word developed. It has a similar meaning, not exactly the same but we get the same concept. G, the fact that presbyteros is distinct from episcopos is clear from a proper understanding of the etymological, etymological, linguistic, historical, theological, biblical data. And we are not speaking of identical offices, but of quality and characteristics a man must possess in order to hold an ordained office. The fact that the New Testament possibly or potentially uses a contextualized shorthand in no way mitigates or eliminates the distinct and separate meaning of the two terms. And yes, all of this is in the book, so you're not, gonna, you're not missing anything. I'm doing this primarily for recorded purposes. So when the New Testament speaks of presbyteros or elder in Acts or other places, what is being identified as a man or group of men who are old, dignified, and of sufficient character to be, to be clergy. As a Marine, we go through boot camp. And we are tested in boot camp. A lot of guys join. Not everybody makes it. Right, JP? We have 68 in my class, 14 in the seat. I went through, I was 26 years old. I was older than all but two men in my platoon. I finished in the top 19 men out of 70. Some guys from a class of guys 
admit it. Some guys don't. Some presbyters become priests or bishops. The majority don't. It's that simple. That some or some in a group could possibly be ordained, most in the group probably are, I'm just repeating myself, are not, but in no way does the mere utterance of the term presbyteros, as if it was some magical phrase, mean we're speaking of an office of an ordained man in the context of the church of the first three centuries. The data is very clear. Men were chosen for ministerial office because they had the necessary qualities to be ordained. They had the qualities of being presbyteros. And, elder. and then finally, finally, the reason this is such a significant issue is due to the manner in which this term, presbyteros, elder, is identified in today's ecclesiastical discussions. The assertion is made that the manner in which presbyteros, elder, is used today is taken directly from scripture and hence all biblical and theological arguments are alleged to bear the authoritative weight of God's word. That's why it's so critical to understand the true distinction between these two terms. In other words, presbyteros, elder, and episcopos, bishop, are synonyms or synonymous terms and therefore interchangeable. Since they are interchangeable, so the argument goes, we are not talking about different offices, but merely different functions. However, as we have seen, and I believe rather convincingly that this is not the case at all, but the fact that we are in fact talking about two separate terms with markedly different meanings. There's also the matter of the development of Episcopal offices arriving virtually immediately in the church in its historical context. If the office of bishop <clears throat> is not synonymous with the office, quote unquote, of elder because no such office existed, then by the sheer logic of the historical account, the office of bishop stands alone and in primacy as the highest office of clerical orders. The fact that the quote-unquote office of elder was not an ordained office until the first three centuries plus of the church and when it is finally seen as an ordained office, it is within Judaism, not Christianity, ends the discussion of synonymy between the terms. It has to just by the weight of the historical evidence it has to. Consequently, if the current contention that the way both terms are used today cannot be supported from scripture or history, how the term is used today must be brought into conformity to the correct biblical, theological, lexical, and historical usage. Plainly put, it must be acknowledged that elder, quote unquote, as a rule, as a biblical form of church polity is in fact wrong and not at all a biblical form of church polity but a much later fabrication to suit a particular agenda episcopoi or bishops then are most certainly presbyteroi, presbyteroi elders or better distinguished old men with beards but presbyteroi elders are not always bishops. So, now that you've suffered through that, questions? Where do the Levites fit in, in this? This, I don't have this in, I don't have this in uh, descending order. I mean, uh, ascending, uh, yeah, descending order. This is not primary blah 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 blah. But if you're looking for um, how these would par these would parallel out, uh, this would be uh, this would be high priest bishop. This would be Priest, no, and priest. Yeah. And this would be, you can figure it out. Levi, 
generally speaking, this is the way. This is the way to break down. So, I won't say it correctly, the first one, the Council of Elders. Yeah, was made up Garcia. Garcia is only made up of elder Levites, or was made up of any Jews? No, elder men. Elder, elder men. men, yeah. Okay. So now, the, you have to remember. The Levite priest, high priest was in the temple, and the first ones were in the synagogue. Yeah, these are, these are, yeah. Okay. God. That's the definition. And then this would be temple. And this would be okay, church. Okay. And the interesting thing about this is if you'll notice this, this is simply how the synagogue developed. Now we know that the synagogue was not a was not a uh, a divinely inspired in the sense of commanded ministry to take place. It took place as a substitute. It was a stop gap because it arose during the captivity, Babylonian captivity, around 500s BC, about 515, somewhere in there. But how did they structure the synagogue? The model of the, 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 model of the temple. The model of the temple. So what would, the, what would the Jews then naturally have carried into the New Testament period when Jesus is around? The same structure. I've been doing this for 30, going over this for 30 years. And the more I do it, the more obvious it becomes to me. Now maybe I'm brainwashing myself. I'm just repeating the same nonsense over and over again. And it's, by, it's, it's confirmation bias. I don't think so. I think I've presented a lot information and data to support my argument. I think I've mentioned the, the opposing argument uh, enough times. But the only way you can deny this structure, the only way that you can gainsay this, is if you cut Israel off, if you cut Judaism off from Christianity. If you become a heretic. Sorry. If you become a Montanist or a Gnostic. I don't like the God of the Old Testament, so you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to get rid of the Old Testament. Oh, well, wait a minute. Matthew is all Jewish. I'm going to get rid of Matthew. Eh, there are parts of Luke that's kind of Jewish. I'm going to get rid of that. Peter's kind of Jewish. Ah, I don't like Peter. So what do you got? Nine books of Paul? A couple passages from Luke? And John, because they all think John was a Gnostic. You have to have that connection. The term, I mean, we, we've talked about this. I, I beat this horse to death, but you don't understand the terms in Christianity. You don't understand the concepts in Christianity unless we understand our roots. And our roots are Judaism. What does atonement mean? Well, if you take a Hellenistic form, we're going to go sacrifice a goat, we're going to read its entrails, and we're going to see how many rocks are in its kidneys. Well, okay, I'm, I feel good about my forgiveness of sins. <laughs> without, the, without a Jewish understanding of the atonement, we don't have atonement. And everything we talk about, covenant, what, the Greeks didn't have a concept of covenant? Of course they had a con concept of covenant. The Romans didn't have a covenant? Of course they did. The word that we use, <laughs> the word that we use for the recitation of that document that was produced in Nicaea, what do we call that? The Nicaean Creed. You know what credo means? I believe. I believe. When we talk about the Eucharist, it means, or we define it as a sacrament. You know what a sacrament is? It comes from the military term, oath. When you receive the sacrament, you are repeating your oath to Christ. You know, we don't understand any of these terms, any of these terms, unless we have a foundational understanding of the connection between Judaism and Christianity 
and that goes for offices as well. We saw very, very early on in chapter, I think it was chapter 2, where I talked about the fact that when Yahweh established his kingdom, what did he do? He gave us this whole list of things, right? He gave us administrators. Oh my gosh, elders. These stole my heart. There they are. But he also gave us three offices of ministers, right? So from the very start, they're not the same. From the very, from Jump Street. Anything else? Questions? Deacons uh, deal with the concerns of the people. They take those concerns to the priest who supposedly deals with them, and the bishop makes sure that the priest is willing to take those Is that? It could fair? be. Um, it could be that the deacon takes it straight to the bishop. <coughs> In, in the early church, in many instances, the deacon was a direct assistant to the bishop. Again, keep in mind that even though these things are in place, we had to gel. This is, a, this is like a fine stew. I mean, it, just, it has to cook for a while. We got all the ingredients, but it takes a little bit for it to kind of all gel where we get that that nice rich flavor. Well this is what basically we've got going on here. It took a bit of time to work <coughs> all of this out. But I will tell you this. There is no one who has any knowledge of the first century church that will argue, at least not that I know of, that will argue that the earliest form of a, that the earliest form of church government wasn't episcopacy. No one makes that argument. My church history professor in seminary was a Presbyterian. Uh, he, he was Christian reform, but essentially Presbyterian model. And he said, "This is what made me an Anglican." He said, "The earliest form of church government we have is episcopacy," but they're wrong. That was what he said. The earliest form of church government was Episcopacy. The late Peter Toon wrote in a book, Four Views of Church Government, and it's, it's the single greatest sentence I've ever read. He said, there is no other example of church government in the first 300 years of the church. None. You cannot find anything. And any other example that even is brought forth, such as the Gnostics, was heretical. Tertullian said, you show us your bishops, O Gnostics, show us. And we'll show you our bishops all the way back to the beginning. Now, if Elder Rule was the only proper biblical rule how did Episcopacy develop at a time when heretics were burned and destroyed? How did that happen? How could Ignatius or Polycarp or Papias, disciples of John and disciples of disciples of John, how could Papias teach something other than episcopacy because he was taught by the Apostle John. How could he teach something other than episcopacy while his beloved John was still alive and John not call him to test? How is that possible? Because we know John went nuts with other heretics. John was a 90-something-year-old man in a Roman bathhouse. Now, you got to picture this. He's a 90-something-year-old man in a Roman bathhouse, and in walks Saturninus. Or was it Valentinus? It was one of the Gnostic heretics. This is a 90-year-old man who jumped up out of the Roman bath naked and ran out of the Roman bath screaming, 
at the top of his lungs, run for your life, run for your life, the heretic, whichever one it was, is here, and the roof was going to cave in on us. But yet his disciples could teach a form of church government that he did not advocate? Now, that's an anecdotal argument. But I think it's a pretty powerful anecdotal argument when you consider that the reason the Romans didn't execute John, the Apostle John, was because of John's reputation. He was so beloved and so well respected within the Christian community at that time as the last living apostle <coughs> that they didn't want to execute him because they were afraid they were going to cause another war. But Episcopacy is wrong. Because we found out something 1,500 years later that we decided to insert in the first century. I mean, come on. Anybody else? Questions? You're all ready to go out and argue with your Baptist friends? You don't know what you're talking about, guys. You're heretics. <laughs> Pardon me? Uh, Presbyterians. Yeah, I, I, I know what I, I know what those guys say. Oh yeah, they they overseer and yeah. Overseer and yeah. Casual shift from elder to overseer yeah. shows he understands the two terms as referring to the same office. Yeah. Now I just gave you I borrowed this from Ray Sutton. But I, we just went through this, right? Yeah. How in the world can you get that out of that? You get three characteristics for an elder, 13 for a bishop, but they the same office. Because Paul is telling Titus, as an elder, you need to be blameless. Why? Because you need to be blameless. I mean, yeah. I, I, this is what happens. And I, look, I have the utmost love for the guys. I, I, I know some of the guys that have done the notes in the Bible. I have the utmost respect for them. But it's these notes, and this is why you never ever take anything below the line in the bottom of your Bible as the Word of God, because it ain't. But I have the utmost respect for these guys, but this is the perfect example of what happens when you have a presupposition set in your mind, and you simply build your argument based on arguments that were made Three and four hundred years ago, and you don't re-examine the material, and you just keep reinforcing your own bias. Now, look, I'll tell you. I'll be the first to tell you that I could be wrong. I, I don't think I'm wrong. I think I've presented a pretty substantial case. I've had my Presbyterian friends basically say this is the best argument for Episcopacy they've ever had. I know a lot of the guys left. The, uh, many of the people that I've had talk to me have left Presbyterianism once they read my book. But we are all conditioned by our culture and by our context. 200 years from now, somebody may look back and say, oh man, what an idiot. Boy, he really missed this by a mile. Or he missed the other thing by a mile. Why? Because it's a blind spot, and we all have it. So I don't denigrate what took place in the first century, because what were they dealing with? Life and death issues. We don't, this, none of this is life and death. If it were, we'd have one form of church government. <laughs> we would. Uh, but it's not. Even during the Reformation, when it was life and death issues. Even then, at the early start, we really only had four. We had Rome, we had Greek Orthodoxy, we had Anglicanism, and then we had Protestantism. It wasn't until later that Protestantism, that the Protestants set the pattern for us today, and it's like, well, instead of, you know, Reconciling, let's just split and create something new. And that's what they wind up doing. Um, but yet, we all have blind spots. And I, I, I hope somebody one day 
can point out a blind spot. That's why I put the book out. I, I didn't put this, I didn't write the book to make a name for myself. I wrote the book because my wife kept saying, write the stinking book. <laughs> <laughs> but I wanted to contribute to the discussion because there's nothing more important today than the question of the church. What is the church? Because if we don't understand what the church is, we don't understand who has the authority to speak for Christianity. We don't understand who has the authority to tell us what is and is not God's Word. And this drives people crazy when you say that. But we've gone through this argument in the book. Two people go to Great Britain, one's the ambassador to the court of St. James, one isn't, right? We've gone through this. The one who isn't is a PhD in foreign policy, knows everything there is to know about Great Britain. The ambassador to the court of St. James is the representative of the president. He speaks something, the guy with the PhD says, no, you're wrong, but who has the authority to speak for the president? The one that has the authority transmitted to him by the president. This is why the church is so important. Everybody quotes today, oh, the priesthood of all believers, the priesthood of all believers. Well, yeah, but Israel is a nation of priests. I, I don't see Itzhak Cohen running into the temple or tabernacle pushing the high priest aside to sacrifice a goat. No. Israel had its responsibility as a nation of priests to take what God's word said to them to a fallen world. As priest, as the priesthood of believers, it's your responsibility. Now I'm going to lay this on your feet. It's your responsibility to take this stuff out and tell the world. It's our responsibility to feed you. It's our responsibility to care for you and to nurture you and to protect you from making errors. But once we teach you, get on your horse, get out there. Because that's what it means to be the priesthood of all believers. Because if, if we have that mentality, the priesthood of all believers, why, doesn't, why don't we have congregations of Orthodox Christians? Why don't we have congregations where people take turns? Why don't we become Plymouth Brethren? Everybody's got a word of the Lord. Because we realize that's insanity. Imagine John MacArthur's church. 3,900, 4,000 people on one, at one Sunday service. John preaches for 45 minutes, and then everybody else gets up and preaches for 45 minutes. People would be dying in the pews. So, Christian world believers doesn't mean that we have no ordained offices. We have different offices. You are waving at me, Diane. What do you no, want to say? Oh. I was thinking, Teresa, I think, will verify this, is that when you're born and raised here, to question the Bible is to, in everybody's opinion, to start down a road to apostasy, to, to, how could you question this? Just read it. It's like, okay, but what do you do with your question? Well, you go to a man who is a self-appointed preacher, who wanted himself to preach sitting in the bathroom studying and that's how you get the church of John and the church of Philip and the church of Jim over there well let me ask you a question uh, and I, I understand what you're saying we've been doing this for seven months right have I ever quoted scripture to you Have I ever used scripture? Yeah. Just nod and say, yeah. Well, well yeah. <laughs> See, it isn't. Thank you. It isn't a matter of how you can question the word of God because I'm not questioning God's word. 
and your interpretation of God's word because your interpretation of God's word is devoid of other necessary elements that contribute to a proper understanding of God's word and that gets us back to who has the authority to speak for the church. Questions? Okay, you know what? We're going to stop now so that we can eat. And then I'm sure you have all sorts of questions that you would like to ask then. Okay? All right, lunch. <laughs>